Good uh, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to see how this country has changed uh, since uh, I used to come here as a journalist accompanying the likes of Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair and this amazingly impressive uh, LEAP conference. I'm delighted uh, to be here uh, with uh, Bjorge and uh, we're going to talk for 20 minutes uh, about those issues. Bjorge, great to see you. Good to see you. Now, Ericsson, your company, must be one of the oldest here, founded in 1876, 100, more than 100,000 employees around the world, and yet you were one of the first people to come to LEAP last year and to see, see the point of it. That's true. We uh, participated in LEAP last year, and because we believe in this region, this region is developing, just like you said, when you come here every year, you see the difference the progression, the ambition, the willingness to invest. And that made us say that we need to be part. And that's why we came. And, and as CEO, I think you've been CEO since uh, 2017, what, what are the preoccupations globally for Ericsson at the moment? It's all about the rollout of 5G. 5G, it's, uh, it's a key digital infrastructure that's going to be enabling the future digitalization of society. So we are really driving that rollout as fast as possible. That, I would say, is our, what preoccupies us. And what we see is that this region has a very strong commitment to digital infrastructure. And what do you mean when you talk about the digitalization of society? I think of it as you know, the consumer actually largely digitalized. So think back 15 years. Most of us would have a photo album. We would have a DVD player, we would have a CD player, and we would probably have a desktop that's sitting in a prominent position in the room. Today, the consumer has largely gone digital. We store the pictures in the cloud. We may not even have a digital camera. We use the cell phone. We stream movies, music, etc. So we have dramatically changed the consumer on the back of a cell phone and a 4G network. So without the 4G network, the consumer wouldn't digitalize. What we see now, it's the next step. We're going to continue to drive digitalization for the consumer. So the way we meet, maybe more, you know, in, call it in the holographic space, the metaverse in that sense. But we're also going to do, we're going to use that for travel. But we're, the next step here is that we digitalize countries. So we start to connect everything. And when everything is connected, we can optimize supply chains. We can minimize number of accidents in the roads, etc. So that's a gigantic leap ahead of us. And your interaction as a citizen with government organizations would be entirely through what you hold in your pocket on your iPhone, effectively. Uh, that's, that's the way I think. We're going to file our tax return that way. We're going to, if we need government services, that's what we're going to use. It's much more efficient than if everyone's on paper. And what about, I think it's uh, well over a billion people who are not connected at the moment. Almost three billion. Yeah. I think that's a, a, the, one of the biggest divides we have the, between the connective and unconnected. And here we as, I, I think we need to recognize we need to close that digital divide. So we, we at Ericsson, we're investing together with ITU and, and the UNICEF on actually making sure that we connect all schools in the world by 2030. Because I, I think unless we close the digital divide, we are going to have a lot of people left behind. And the privacy of those individuals, uh, how does that stand? The, the privacy of those individuals. <laughs> of course, that's a big question, right? Uh, where data privacy laws will have to be enacted around the world, and they will look somewhat different. And we need, of course, to, to protect each individual. That's not really the business we are in, but, but I think there will be new regulation coming here or, or legislation. Now, 5G, you've mentioned that already as, as, as your priority. What's so special about 5G? Why is it 
such a step. 5G gives a couple of, of extra features. I often say it gives 10 times the speed. It gives about one-tenth of the latency or the delay in the network. And it allows you to have more than 100 times as many connected devices on each oh, whatever surface area. So it gives you unique features that you can't have otherwise. So it's, it, what it does is it basically, if you think about connecting everything today, most of the problems are that you simply cannot have capacity enough to connect everything. That's why you need 5G. So this is the Internet of Things, as people call it sometimes. Yeah. And what, how will that affect, for example, the pursuit, uh, international pursuit of net zero and uh, sustainable uh, life? That's a great question and, and actually a very important topic. I think digital technologies are going to be a key contributor to reduce carbon emissions. And we already know today, if you just look at the few industry sectors, so take manufacturing, logistics, mining, we can actually reduce carbon emissions by 15%, percent one five, um, by just levering current technologies. And that's compared to the ICT industry today contributing with 1.5% of the greenhouse gases. So it's a, it's a massive help in actually achieving net zero. And we got some examples here in, in, in the kingdom. For sure. Yeah. I think what we see here is, I think the, the kingdom has recognized a couple of things. It recognized that digital and the digital transformation is going to be important for the country. But it took more, more than just saying that, they took the initiative to make sure you get the digital infrastructure, you bring, like bringing more females into the working population, and it was impressive to see the ICT minister's graph, where it's, it's actually higher female participation in tech sector here than in Silicon Valley or in, in Europe. But that brings new talent into the market, I think also there is a new look at regulation. How do we need to regulate bankruptcy laws and some of these boring things needs to be put in place and they're getting in place here. So I, I think the kingdom is a bit, you know, compa it's not only talk, it's actually walk as well. And, and 5G, do you see that as the end of the transition into digital? The only thing we know is uh, technology has so far never reached an end. The head of the uh, US patent office in the beginning of 1900 said famously that now everything is invented so we can close this down. He was utterly wrong. So I, I do believe we're going to see a lot more. But, but if you look here, we're, we're on the way to next generation technology as well. It will probably take five, six years for that to come, maybe seven. But that will allow us to use new frequencies with even more capacity, more speed, and even lower latency. And, I mean, of course, famously, uh, people said, why do you need the talkies, for example? <laughs> and, and as far as the individual's experience, is that going to change dramatically? I think from a consumer point of view, you get more speed if you only use it for you know, video and social media, you may not appreciate that. It's actually the new use cases that's going to come that demand the speed. So if you want to use uh, AR glasses, for example, you need a lot of processing, a lot of data need to go back and forth. And that's where you start to see the new use cases. Or you take AI. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about uh, cognitive AI or generative AI. That's a big topic, but it also consumes a lot of data, and that's where the consumer is going to see the benefit. We're both Europeans. Am I right in saying that in this... Uh, you're Europe British, is... I'm European. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, we're an off I'm an offshore European. Yeah. But are we right in saying that Europe is lagging behind, even yeah. although you, of course, are a Swedish company? It's true. Uh, Europe is truly lagging behind on the digital infrastructure. Uh, actually, that's a, 
as a as, as a European, that's a concern. Uh, and why do I say that? It's interesting with 4G, that was actually the highways where we digitalized the consumer. In reality, uh, China and the US were the first two countries there. Most of the jobs created in digital have been created in those countries. That's why we need to think about job creation in a different way. And that's why you, you need to get the digital infrastructure in place early. And Europe doesn't have that. Europe has other issues as well on competitiveness. But we for sure lack the digital infrastructure. And, and that's why I often say a prerequisite for digitalization is the digital infrastructure. And you know, think about it in, an, in a more analog world. So a country without roads are terribly unlikely to have an automotive industry. Why, so, why so do you think it is? Here. Why have we got left behind? Because roads you see, digital highways you don't see. And, and so as a person you cannot see when it's congested in the digital world. So when you, your phone doesn't connect, it's typically congestion rather than coverage. And by contrast, this region, this country, are are in the vanguard, are they? Actually, this region was one of the first to launch 5G around the world. And when we did the speed tests uh, in the early days of 5G, it was dominated by, by Saudi. That's where we saw the most of the tests, actually, which showed that it was rolled out earlier than anywhere else in, in the world. So that was to do with the government spotting the opportunity, was it? I think the government here sees that you need a strong digital infrastructure to create the jobs in the future and create the transformation of the economy. And, and they, they have been on the forefront here on allocating spectrum, on, on facilitating investments. And tell us a little about your, your workforce here. Yeah, we have, um, you know, we're, we've been in, in Saudi Arabia since uh, 1980. Uh, it's one of our important markets. We have uh, a, a fairly sophisticated collaboration, which is actually mostly on 6G with uh, uh, King Abdullah University for Science and Technology. It's actually very important for us because it's, a, it, it's, a, uh, it's very good research program there that links into us. So for us, that's a very natural collaboration where we spend quite a lot of effort and we're very happy with the results uh, so far. And of course, it's all part of that journey. Another part which I think is, is very interesting is of the, uh, the people we have recruited the last four years, 40% are females. And that's where we make, uh, have made an extra effort and continue to make an effort. And all from this country? All from this country. And. Uh, it, that, uh, you've been coming here for a while, and as you say, uh, Ericsson's been here for a long time, quite a change. It is a change, it's a dramatic change. And um, I may, maybe coming here several times a year, actually, the, the changes, normally when you come that often, you don't see them, because they're gradual. But in this country, I would say the changes have been so fast that is actually visible even when you come several times a year. And if you look ahead to LEAP next year and the years beyond, what are the changes you're expecting to see here? I mean, I, I, mean they're, they're, I think Saudi established a vision 2030 that's very powerful that the country is investing for. And so I'm, I'm convinced what we're going to see next year is, is a continued momentum on that curve, whether it is for uh, direct investments here whether it is to build, you know, we can talk a bit about that, but, but build the digital skills in the economy. I think we're going to see a progression of those areas. And, and I certainly hope we're going to see progression on the digital infrastructure. And what, what do you mean by digital skills? What, what, what's lacking? I wouldn't say it's lacking, uh, but I, I, I think it, there is a shortage of digital skills globally. Uh, and that with that, I mean, you know, at the higher end, it's programmers, coders, system engineers, mm. etc. Uh, so 
a need to invest there is pretty obvious, and we, we need to invest in the whole world in these areas. I think we're going to see more people developed in that area here, but we may also see people starting to move into uh, the region from other countries because of the, the, the ecosystem that is starting to be formed here. And your business, the building of uh, radio access networks, where, where does AI, artificial intelligence, fit into that? You know, for us, we, we use AI for a couple of things. It's, it's back to one of your first questions, you know, energy efficiency and call it the green transition. We're trying to do that as well, so we're trying to lower energy consumption in our products. Uh, and, and today, one bit of data is about 10 times more efficient on 5G compared to 4G. So if we have the explosion of data that we've seen over the past several years or decade, it's almost impossible to produce that in a 4G network. You need 5G for that. So, so that type of energy efficiency we see, but maybe where AI is even more useful is to predict traffic pattern. So we can actually shut off certain parts of a network, certain sites, when they are not needed, and thereby save energy. So AI plays a role in how you operate the network more. And who, who are your competitors building networks? Because it's a pretty sort of, it takes big companies, doesn't it? And there's not much, uh, it's not numerous companies, there are only a few in each sector. Yeah. It's not that many. Yeah. You would know them. Huawei would be one, would it? I've heard of them. <laughs> They're here. And uh, it, is it a competition which you regard as healthy or? You know, I think competition, you have to look at it from, from a couple of ways. Whether it, you know, I, I prefer to not focus on if competition is healthy or not. Sure. I focus rather on what we can do. So my priority is, is really to make sure that we can be a technology leader. If we are a technology leader, if we can produce a bit of data cheaper than competition with higher performance, then we'll win. And that's going to be our focus. Some people here have said, well, actually, the real competition for the sort of networks you establish, and I have to admit, I don't quite understand this, but they say, well, the cloud is the competition. Cloud is one competitor, uh, but they're also a partner, and we collaborate with them. I you couldn't do the cloud without you, could you? No, they, they, they need connectivity. Yeah. So if you think about the, why did the cell phone become so big, it was the connectivity. It's a, in a way, it's a low part of the value in the value chain, but it's a critical part. So if you take away connectivity, what would a smartphone be? It would be pretty dumb. Well, that was going to be my final question. How does this all monetize? Where, where, are, where is the value? Where are people going to make money? Yeah, we have been in a phase now on 4G where we pay subscriptions. Basically, we have paid a monthly fee and we have gotten it varies by country, but sometimes unlimited, sometimes very high data rates. We don't believe that's going to be the future model. Uh, that's going to be one part of the revenues for the operators going forward. But it needs to be complemented. And that's, we need to, to actually start to pay when we use the extra resources in the network. So if you, for example, you run a surgical procedure. You want to make sure that you have low latency. Or if you have an ambulance connected and you want to make sure that you have the speed to transmit the x-ray, then you buy that as you consume it. And that's a change in the way you monetize a network. We think that's going to be critical uh, for the whole industry and actually reshape the industry and the way we charge for the services. So you may end up as a consumer with a monthly subscription, but then as you buy new features, you're, you know, you're on a gaming console and you decide to do mobile gaming, you pay a bit extra. You're going to be paying a lot more than you're paying at the moment? But that's because you use new services. And uh, finally, I was watching the opening ceremony here with someone from America 
saying it would be impossible to have an opening ceremony in America where everyone's very gloomy about the economy and prospects for the future. What, what about Ericsson? Oh, I'm very optimistic about the future. I think, the, of course, there are always going to be short-term setbacks. Europe probably fighting, the US might be fighting in that the, a recession, uh, fighting other things as well. But, but I, I, I honestly think the world is going to be a better place in a few years' time than today, and that creates new opportunities. Bori Akum, thank you very thank much you. indeed. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much indeed to Borje Ekom and Adam Bolton here at Leap.